Good morning. It is Thursday and Holy Week, and I hope your Holy Week has been truly blessed. Saw something in the chat here that I'm very curious about, that uh, Pope Francis is apparently being followed around by the Mothman. If you have a link to that, send me an email, because uh, that's not where we're going with this stuff today, with this topic today. But uh, you have my curiosity peaked, to put it mildly, and I'm not a big believer in uh, in cryptids and things, but, you know, I will admit that demons may manifest in some way to to uh, really lead people astray. I have no doubt about that. But if you've got an email, send me an email. I'm very curious. Um, so today, I'm going to talk about the article from Rorate Chaley that they put out the other day, where and we're going to go over some of the, ex- the examples here in a little more detail than they do. Because they're pointing out that Francis's papacy, alleged papacy, has been filled with bad omens. And uh, you, that's putting it mildly. So here's the article that they did. And I'll have links to this in my show notes a few minutes after this live stream ends. But, but they give us this headline. Francis, a pontificate filled with bad omens. The icon of Christ the Redeemer falls down during Vatican Easter Mass. Yeah, uh, that's, ne- that's never a good thing. Um <laughs> There's been a lot of these kinds of events happening. Some of them are just really eye-opening. Many of you have seen, are aware of a lot of these. Um, so I'll add a few things to uh, my own of my own observations here to what's this in this article because it's a, this is a short piece. So we're not just going to read the article and then call that a live stream. <laughs> I'll add a couple of my own observations as time has gone on here. But this is being taken as a bad omen, right? And to a degree, should we pay heed to these kinds of things? Well, I, I've seen a lot of chatter from much more moderate people than myself in the, uh, I would call the greater traditional movement, saying on social media that past generations would have seen this event as an omen. They would have seen it. Like past generations of Catholics who had greater supernatural faith than probably most of us do would have seen this as an omen. And they would have seen that and a lot of the other things that we're talking about here as an omen. So let's Let's, um, you know, we'll give it, let's go to the benefit of the doubt here on this one and go into this a little bit, maybe taking everything with a slight grain of salt, just because remember, we don't want to become like the Catholic version of the evangelical Protestant types who stand there on the street corners with their signs saying the that uh, the rapture is happening on a certain date, right? We don't want to become like that. So let's talk about this here. So from their, from their article, quote, on Easter Day, during Mass at the Vatican, a gust of wind more powerful than the others caused the ancient icon of Christ the Redeemer on the courtyard facing St. Peter's Basilica to fall ruinously to the ground. Two attendants immediately intervened to put back up the heavy support that had collapsed just a few meters from the Pope during the Easter ceremony, an anomalous and curious episode on which many have dwelt to trying to identify messages, as if that fact could be a heavenly sign capable of unveiling future events. A certainly unforeseen anomaly that was inevitably juxtaposed with other signs that have occurred in recent years coinciding with major Vatican changes. We'll pause here because they're going to start going into other things. So what you had happened was the what you had happened was that a gust of wind just blew down a picture of Christ the Redeemer at the Easter Mass. You have to understand there's some some symbolism there that could be you could interpret it with symbolically and that has raised some eyebrows and now you've got a lot of comparisons to other things that have happened so i'm going to go over we're going to be going back and forth between this article and others here shortly so we'll just keep continue here he says for example the famous lightning bolt that struck the large iron cross located on the top of saint peter's in 2013 on the very day on which then pontiff benedict the 16th renounced the throne of peter to retire to private life on the vatican hill private life. We'll put an asterisk next to that. (laughs) It was February. It was pouring rain. And that eerie image taken by aunts, a photographer on a stormy day immediately went around the world, symbolizing a historic, almost apocalyptic moment with prophetic meaning for many. Yeah. um, If have you ever seen the footage of that? A lot of people may never have actually seen it. So I'm going to show you the actual footage from this. Make sure we're muted here. This is the this is what the BBC recorded here. Um, 
skip, we'll roll that back, that beautiful B roll back a little bit. So here's what the VPBC got, right? That's the day of the announcement. That's a pretty big deal, I think. And I could, you know, I live in storm country. I see lightning all the time, but I've never seen anything like this. This is, this is something else entirely. The, the initial omen for the Fran for Francis's alleged pontificate was before the, even the conclave that put him on the throne of Peter. That's just example one, right? So this article just kind of goes through these things, but there's some they leave out. And some of them, because some omens are really self-imposed omens. Some of these are things that he did to himself, right? So let's continue. In the list of emblematic images captured by the lenses of photojournalists. Oh, hold on. I need to actually bring, bring that back up. Um, yeah, there it is. In the list of emblematic images captured by the lenses of photojournalists, but also by the cell phones of ordinary believers, there's some rather curious ones that when viewed in retrospect at a distance of time actually seem to warn of impending radical changes or important transitions. During the conclave on the Vatican Square, for example, a never-before-seen individual, dressed in a Franciscan habit all tattered, barefoot was glimpsed wandering through the crowd. The man stood praying motionless under the cold drizzle of those days. Now, I haven't been able to find anything about this. But that that it almost sounds like they're implying that that was like St. Francis of Assisi himself like manifesting there to, as another omen or warning. And I have no reason to believe whatsoever that uh, Franca Gian Soldati, the author of this piece, would have made this up. This was not published on the s April 1st. Lerati Chaley doesn't do April Fool's jokes. I, I have no reason to think that they would make this up. But this was, again, during the conclave. Francis, you know, Jorge Bergoglio hadn't won the support of his peers yet. This happened. Hey, a never before seen individual dressed in a Franciscan habit, all tattered, barefoot, was glimpsed wandering through the crowd. Man stood praying motionless under the cold drizzle of those days. And then we're going to go. This is uh, most people have heard this one. Then a short time later, there was the release of the Dove of Peace during an Angelus that was immediately attacked and mortally wounded by a crow and a seagull while in flight. Let's. Uh, I want to show you that story. You, 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 you've probably remember this, but this is worth actually going back to. So again, we go to the BBC and for their reporting on this. Oh, come on. How do I close down that advertisement? Oh, whatever. We'll just deal with the advertisement pop-up. No, I'm not going to use... People have told me to use uh, things that prevent that from happening, but the problem is you, YouTube won't work if I do that, so I can't. Um. So, but this was published back in 2014, January 26, 2014, with a headline from the BBC, Pope's Peace Doves Attacked by Crow and Seagull. I remember people commenting on this in those days. I, was, I wasn't on YouTube. I was about four years away from being on YouTube at this point. But I remember this raising eyebrows even among his most strident defenders and strident supporters in early 2014. Two white doves released by children while standing alongside Pope Francis in Vatican City as a peace gesture have been attacked by other birds. And then there's the pictures of it. I mean, I, I have never heard of that happening before in the papacy. A seagull and a crow swept down on the doves after they were set free from the apostolic palace during the Pope's weekly Angelus prayer. Tens of thousands of people watched as one dove struggled to break free, but the crow pecked repeatedly at the other. They're not sure what happened to the doves as they flew away. That's, um again, kind of an ominous thing that most people actually did comment on when it happened. It says, again, and again, during a solemn mass in the square, one of the curial cardinals fell from his chair and ended up on the ground, becoming a symbol of a curia that would shortly be turned inside out by Bergoglio's draconian action. At that time, he was preparing the reform to give a new structure and renewed rules to the apparatus racing old secular privileges and resetting many customs to zero, a strong move that had enormous backlash across the Tiber. Yes. Yeah, so uh, right when he's issuing key reforms to the Roman Curia, one of the curial cardinals sitting there, he doesn't, they don't name who it was, fell out of his chair and <laughs> on his back on the, on the ground. Uh, again, very symbolic. Again, the kind of thing most people might not pick up on, but you start putting these in context and it gets to be really kind of eerie, but this is not the only, that dove story, 
was not the only one. I think a lot of people have never heard this one. And again, the doves that were released during the Pope's trip to Armenia on the Turkish border, the birds were inexplicably returned. They, they literally came back like, nope, you're not going to get peace here. Francis was in the medieval monastery of Korvarop together with the Armenian patriarch Karak in the second. To the surprise of those present, the birds advanced through the air for a few meters, circled, and then inexplicably turned back. They would not hear of, of going into the other country. Peace between the two would, not, would never come. Indeed, war events were even being prepared at that time. The, so let's go to that story because I have that one for you too. Um, we'll have to unfortunately use... Uh, an archive version of the story because this is no wrong one. <laughs> I kept the, I kept the original one up, but we'll have to use it. We'll have to use the archive one for this. So um, this is, uh, why do I keep opening that one? So we'll have to, yeah, a little technical issue here, but here it is. Got the right one now. So, this story was reported in 2016, June 26th of 2016. In uh, this, this came from the Hindu Times, actually, or the Hindu.com. Headline: Pope releases peace doves on Armenia Turkish border, and they turned around and flew right back. Now, the thing about it, when you look at the articles here, they never mention that the birds came, turned around, and came back to to Francis. They never mention that. I looked around and I could barely see any reporting that mentioned that there's a little bit out there, but the news articles that are generally very pro Francis never ever mention that he released them. And a short time later, they came back refusing to refusing to do their part in the symbolic act of peace there. And so we, we continue though. Then it was the turn of the sudden collapse of the roof of the carpenter's church near the Capitol, a sacred building entrusted to the Jesuits and dedicated to St. Joseph, who is the patron saint of the church. Fortunately, the disastrous collapse claimed, claimed nobody was uh, claimed by it, yet questions about the metaphysical significance were not long in coming on that occasion either. And they go into some actual symbolism that happened also with John Paul II, specifically at his funeral. But I want to add you a couple things here of my own, because there were some odd ones. First, of course, we know the Pacamama debacle. I mean, I've, I must have made 50 videos about Pacamama, because... Remember, you have idolatry being allowed in a church or at the Vatican. That's that's not something you let go. It's why you hear people bring up the ESCC conferences in 1988, where the Pope stood there while our while idols were placed on top of tabernacles, and he did nothing about it. I mean, that was Pacamama 1.0. People don't like hearing it, but it's the truth. People bring it up 35 years later, 36 years later, because it had it had that kind of effect on people. Whenever you have something like that happen, it's an omen. And remember, before in the lead up to that, the Pan Amazon Synod, where that happened, we got word from Sister Sasagawa from Our Lady of Akita, who said that she was suddenly with, had received another message from an angel warning her that the world, the, cat, the faithful, need to start doing penance and reparation in October 2019 because things were about to get really bad in the world. Everybody need to basically buckle up and get ready for a rough ride. And then the Pacamama event happened just days. It had happened right about that same time. And then a few weeks later, we started getting word out of the Far East that stuff, some weird things were going on. And well, the rest is history. We know what happened in 2020. Call that an omen if you want. Uh, that's more of a direct message from heaven. I want to show you this other one, though. This other one, I, I'm not going to play this this video because I just don't want to deal with uh, any problems with from our hosts. But you see... Are you familiar with this scene? This is the statue. Uh, this is a statue or a, a ancient crucifix that has been irreparably destroyed by Francis because he put it out there at this event here. The during uh, in 2020 during his special Ubi at Orbi address, the round the ground in there is shiny because it was pouring rain, and he gave essentially a blessing to the cameras because he couldn't have anybody there. That crucifix is still being restored because of what he did. He basically destroyed it in the process of giving a an actual Ubi at Orbi address for the the big events of 2020. And the problem he ended up running into is that was very symbolic. The things that came after, the role of the church in the events of 2020, 
and the deceptions that were going on the how francis himself would issue demands to bishops to go along with what the secular authorities were saying all of those things are very are housed symbolically within that destruction of that crucifix and then there's of course the other one i saw i was happy to see somebody else in the live chat mention this before i went on and that was the destruction or the uh, the empty crowds during francis's angelus addresses consistently empty as time went on the fewer people are showing up now sometimes the pictures are taken a little early but even then you still see like when you get like pictures taken later in the day people say no it's not that bad and then they show you a picture taken later it's still not very good large amounts of empty spaces where faithful who could come to see francis weren't bothering it was mostly roman curial officials media dignitaries and some faithful, but not nearly as many as it used to be. You go back to the early days of his alleged pontificate, and they, the, the crowds were packed, just like they were for Benedict and John Paul II going back. Now there's hardly anybody. What kind of sign do you think that is for the health of the church moving forward? Small else else's huge cup. Actually, this is my small cup. My Bucky's coffee mug you see me using, or my Jaws one, is holds probably six extra ounces of coffee over this one. This just looks big. Forced perspective from the camera. Um, Campbell says, then, uh, Fearing, the most holy mass of the season, the Easter Vigil. Um, yeah, I mean, you get a lot of, you also got a lot of political political things that are over. I don't usually use those as omens because those are just too directly related to human intervention. Um, right. And Tari says, although we were not to be constantly looking for signs, I must admit these incidents are ominous. Right. I don't look for signs. In fact, I always caution people against it. For a good year, year and a half, I on this channel, I did not do very many We Were Warned pro prophecy videos because I was starting to worry that people, some people were beginning to make those, that Catholic prophecy, the center of their devotional life and things. And I did not want any part of that. But we should be aware of signs. We should be aware of them. And it's these kinds of things are a track record. And so when we see today, Francis now not offering the mass publicly, despite the fact that John Paul II, when he was in a towards, in, towards the end of his own pontificate, he was still offering the mass until he physically was a, a, unable to, even with the help of deacons or whatnot, who would actually, you know, help him kneel during the mass. Francis doesn't offer the mass anymore, at least not publicly. I don't know what that means per se. When a priest hits a place where they are physically in a bad position where they can't do it anymore, they are given a pass. They're not required to anymore, logically. I mean, they, they can't do it. They can't do it. It's it's odd to see Francis not do it, though, especially for those of us who remember John Paul II offering the Mass. Yeah, the uh, foot washing thing is weird in light of that, right? Um. Glad to have you there, old guy, books and games. Um, glad to have you here. David Wilson says, we can see the signs, but modernists are blind to them and just dismiss them as natural phenomena. That's, I mean, that's generally true. After a while, there's, I mean, that's why, while I'm skeptical of the coming eclipse thing, there's a lot of coincidences there that I say, look, maybe, maybe not. We will all find out together. Sonny Jim says, I do believe in omens, but they need to be significant, not something like a picture falling. Well, that's why by itself, it doesn't seem that big of a deal. But you put it in the context of other things, the lightning strikes and the other things, it, it begins to form a kind of interesting thing. And it wasn't just a picture falling. It was happening on Easter day at the Easter Vigil Mass. And it was a picture of Christ the Redeemer. That's, you know, think about it. Christ the Redeemer on Easter. I mean, that's that's that, that's interesting by itself. Um. WM says he's getting dental work done during the eclipse. Hey, you know what? Maybe you had the easy time to get in a, an appointment at that time. Fig Tree says people are not overjoyed to see Francis. That's true. The light is also, oh yeah, there's that other one. The St. Peter statue in Argentina struck by lightning on Francis's birthday. Yeah, I reported on that. A lot of people are like, come on, that's not that big a deal. Well, we went over that and then later I went over it again. Some other details that emerged and it turned out that that is one of those coincidences I couldn't ignore. Francis losing his voice is significant. Yeah. Yeah. 
Juliana, I agree with you completely. We shouldn't dismiss things, but I doubt it's the final days. It sounds more like chastisement's on its way. More like maybe three days of darkness, whatnot. I I tend to tend to agree. Like I the end is I don't think is nigh. There's too much left if you've read Daniel and Revelation, and if you've read the uh approved messages from saints and mystics throughout the ages. There's a lot that hasn't happened yet. A lot. Um can't believe you guys are excited to be ruptured on Monday. Uh, bit, I, will, I will hope nobody's excited to be ruptured. Um, there are people who, I don't know, like I, like I say, Anthony, I, uh, from avoiding Babylon, I think you and I would agree. People should not need to be, take caution when talking about kind of these, these sorts of things to not turn into like, you know, the Catholic version of the evangelical with the, uh, you know, the end is coming on May 25th types. You don't want to become like that. You don't want to because it, it just it absolutely just torpedoes all of our attempts to bring people to Christ. Um, yeah. Fig Tree says, I definitely think something big is coming. I've had that feeling for like four or five years now, maybe longer. I mean, I, I kind of remember that even feeling that when I was a teenager. Um, my journey says I came back to the Catholic church one year ago, despite the Pope. Good. Glad to have you back. Don't, don't let a potential Judas stop you from the, from receipt, from, being in our Lord's church. Dr. Obvious points out again, the obvious, just remember Y2K, which turned out to be a big old nothing burger. I'm curious though, if there's any other thoughts in the comments, please let me know at this time. Um, what you think about all this? Do you find any of that stuff just a, you know, kind of a remarkable coincidence or do you think there's more to it than all of that? Let me know here in the live comments. Um, I will wrap this up by also saying that the uh, do thank those who have uh, given support to that uh, Give Send Go campaign that the listener st or the viewer started. Links in the in the live chat, and I'll put one in the in the comments too. But um, I'm curious what you think about this. So um, let's see. Does one need an eclipse of the sun or moon or Earth to change one's life? You shouldn't need that, but some there are people who seem to need like practically direct intervention from from on high to realize you need to change their their way of living and i think that's a lot of us more of us than we care to admit that a lot of people will go through the cycle of mortal sin mortal sin confession mortal sin mortal sin half-hearted repentance mortal sin repentant you know confession over and over again until something intervenes in their life in a very serious way for most people though it's nothing as dramatic as uh you know some solar eclipse or something, <laughs> but some people do need something that is some kind of divine intervention, basically. And Campbell says more people showed up for the morning and evening prayers than now defunct church militants, the Pope's Angelus or other public prayers. This seems to be, or at least in proportion, it does seem to be the case. Uh, Candy, I'm generally a skeptic of the St. Malachi prophecy because it doesn't fit the rest of Catholic prophecy. Unless you give the new reading from that uh, that I've been presenting in the last few weeks from a priest who eliminated the anti popes that were included in the more normal reading of the Saint Malachi prophecy, then it makes sense. But then John Paul II's funeral doesn't uh, with the, that eclipse doesn't seem to mean anything at that point. It just be, turns into a coincidence, which could be what it was. But I don't trust the, the traditional reading of the Saint Malachi prophecy because it doesn't fit with the re with everything else from approved Catholic prophecies and things. It just doesn't. They don't work together. Um, Roland Key says, well, this is all a bit twisted. Yeah, well, that's how that's how omens, importance, and signs and things work often. Um, we had also fog covering the dome of St. Peter's during Benedict's funeral mass. I mean, yeah, little things like that kind of make you wonder. Or how about the fact that the dome at St. Peter's is turning black? Or as some NASA scientists have found, the moon is rusting, <laughs> which has no plausible explanation to it, unless you get some like real deep physics or something. Um, in general, Mike, I think that's bright. He says, might we be better served by being on our knees in adoration, gazing at the Luna holding Jesus and the monstrous at noon on Monday? I mean, that would be better in general. Looking at a natural event or an adoration, which is better? That adoration, always. Um, but yeah, I've, like I said, some people are always surprised when they find that I'm skeptical of the same Malachi prophecy, but I am. It, it's, it's just because, again, 
it doesn't line up with the rest of Catholic prophecy unless you take that new priest reading. Then I can make that actually line up. Because according to his new reading that I covered a few weeks ago, it there should be three or four more after Francis. Four if Francis is an antipope. We'll find out, though. Um, does it go against guidelines to ask for prayers? No. If you've got a prayer request, just uh, you can even leave it unnamed. Just uh, pray for James's pr request, uh, prayer intention. All right, folks. Thanks very much. Yeah. Fig, fig tree is turning black. Yeah, I, I covered that a few months ago. It's uh, go look at the pictures of St. Peter's Basilica 2024 compared to compare them to 2015. They're it's it could be that they just don't have the budget to keep it clean, or it could be something else. I don't know. Uh, Jack, we I, that's we covered that, or uh, we covered that in the stream. That was part of this. All right, folks, thanks very much for tuning in, and as always. Pray for the church. And for again, thanks to those of you who have been donating to that give send go that the viewer started for me. It is appreciated. Link is in the comments and we'll be in the it will be in the comments here shortly and in the uh, live chat now. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria. <laughs>